And I would like to introduce the moderator for this session is Executive Chair Joan McNaughton of World Energy Trilemma of the World Energy Council. With that, I'm going to send my microphone over to her. Thank you very much and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor uh, to be invited to moderate this ministerial dialogue and I can see by the numbers in the hall how interested you all are in what they have to tell us. It's been an interesting day, uh, including with the uh, special address we've just heard from uh, Mr. Seishin. Uh, it's also been a day when we've worked hard to understand uh, some of the important issues around energy, in particular as illustrated by the World Energy Council trilemma. For those of you who've been out in the sunshine rather than working, and I'm sure there isn't anybody, but just in case, uh, we are uh, working on the trilemma to assess countries' energy policies against the three criteria of energy security, energy equity, which encompasses affordability and access, and environmental sustainability. And it is a big challenge to meet all three, an important challenge, but a big one. And at the last session I moderated, one of the questions from the floor was who is responsible for ensuring that we meet all these three goals? And we decided in the panel on that occasion that energy was, quote, too big to fail, unquote, and that actually the risk had to remain with government. So it's a particular pleasure to have this distinguished group of ministers who are going to address the questions for this session and give you their insights into how they deal with these challenges at a time of unprecedented change for energy in transition. As we've just heard, energy is the enabler of prosperity. Eradicating poverty and ensuring growth may require the use of fossil fuels. It will require the use of fossil fuels for some time to come in some countries. But perhaps long term, the failure to innovate and deliver low carbon solutions may be a competitive disadvantage. Is it perhaps too fanciful to think of a world in the future where countries who have not tackled the uh, carbon emission issue face trade barriers for their exports? One can imagine other challenges. In any event, we know the transition requires huge investment, probably up to $37 trillion US by 2035, and 10 to $12 trillion in this region, in Asia alone. So investors need to have confidence in the policies uh, that govern their decisions, and Policymakers want to drive that investment, and we need to think about very carefully how they're going to do it. Now, I'm going to turn to our panel to ask them to uh, address the, the questions for you. Uh, and the uh, first contributor is going to be uh, Walter Steinman, who is the State Secretary for Energy from the ministry in Switzerland. Each of the contributors after Walter will give their own individual perspective, recognizing that the perspectives and the challenges from each country are distinct, but I'm sure by the time we've heard from all of the panel, we'll have some common themes emerging and some important insights. Walter, could you kick us off, please? Thank you very much. Switzerland is like the whole world in the energy field in transition. But we think we have to go step by step. And we have also, because we go to a more and more decentralized energy world together with the people. 
That means we work together with the municipalities, with the cities, and we try to introduce also the citizens and for that, for example, on local level, we founded the initiative Energy City. Second pillar, for us it's important that we have not only a top-down view, it's necessary to have also a bottom-up view. And for that, the competence in the energy field, they are in Switzerland on different level. We have the Confederation, we have the Cantons, and there is a certain competition between the cantons, not only in tax issues, also in energy issues. And then we have the municipalities, and also the municipalities, or every mayor will be the best of the whole, of whole Switzerland. These are principles. Another principle is subsidiarity. That means we don't want to have all competencies by the state. First of all, we look if we find a private solution. Perhaps we can give some support with these private solutions. And we will also have the possibility to work close together with the industry and give some incentives to reach the targets. That's in the middle of our discussions and our policy. We will do this transition together with the industry and also together with the citizen because we know in Switzerland after all political discussions in the main issues we have a popular vote and in the last 10 years we had about eight different popular votes about climate and energy issues and for that it's necessary to have compromises, to have solutions that are acceptable for the majority of our people. Thank you. Walter, thank you very much. And I think that's a, a fascinating insight into how one is working in a multi-layered way and, of course, implying a lot of partnerships. So I'm sure we'll come back to that theme during the session. It's now my pleasure to ask uh, Mr. Ramon Mendez, who's the National Director of Energy from the Ministry of Industry, Energy and Mining uh, in Uruguay uh, to address us. Ramon. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that I would like to begin with two introdu introductory remarks. First, that uh, it's not a unique way of developing for, for uh, emerging economies in order to reach a, a low carbon future. And my, my, second, my second remark is that it's not necessary and even not uh, interesting to import experiences that had already been used so far in, developing country, in, in developed countries. We have to find out our own uh, uh, way. So after these two and to the introductory remarks, let me share what is the Uruguayan experience concerning these aspects. Uruguay is the smallest country in Latin America, in South America, but yet growing, uh, its economy is growing at 6% uh, annually for the last 10 years. For example, the, uh, the in, in the industry sector, the energy demand of the industry sector has grown, has tripled in that only 10 years, just to have an idea, and at the same time, uh, the, sh the, sh the share of poverty is decreasing uh, very rapidly during this, this, uh, this period. For example, we have now more than 99.5% 90, of households connected to the grid. Uh, in this context, Uruguay is a country very different or, or, uh, from other Latin American countries. We have no oil, no coal, no natural gas. And unlike other Latin American countries, we have already used all our potential of hydropower, all our rivers have already been used. So in this uh, complicated context, five years from now, we have developed a national uh, energy policy, which is very interesting. It has been backed by all political par uh, parties in the parliament, and this uh, strong political support has been crucial in the development of, of this, this uh, important transition we are going on. Uh, the main goals of this transition 
and of this uh, national energy policy is, is to include all the dimensionality of the energy sector, including, of course, technological, economic, geopolitical, but also uh, social, ethic aspect, cultural aspects, and, and of course, environmental aspects. Uh, in this framework, uh, with clear uh, regulatory framework and in, uh, given good condition for investment to come, we have reached more than $7 billion of investment within just a period of five years. This is not a, a, a large number for the energy sector worldwide, but for our country, believe me, it's a huge number. Every year, uh, more than 3% of the GDP is reinvested in the energy transformation, and this is really a huge number for at least for the framework of Latin America. Within this transformation, we, we in only two years from now, we shall have more than 90% of renewals in the energy mix, more than 90% in, in the electric mix, uh, with a measure of something like 50% of, uh, of hydropower, more than 30% of wind energy in, in two years from now, 10% of biomass, and the rest of the other 7 8% with LNG, because we are installing a, a LNG regasification terminal. And which is perhaps more interesting in the overall energy mix, will reach more than 50% of renewals as a huge combination of, 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 of many renewals. But perhaps the most important point is that we are not using subsidies. All our policies are just choosing which are the best technology, the most mature technology that are more adequate for our natural resources, for our framework. And, uh, and this are, is allowing us not only not to increase the cost of the energy, but to decrease the cost of the energy. Yes, we are having more than 90% of renewals in the electric mix, and the electricity generation cost is of the order of $5 cents per kilowatt hour. This is the, this is the result of, uh, of the interest of the market. Each time we are making uh, an international bidding process, we have 10, 11, even 20 companies which are bidding for a PPA, and this is crucial to having this, this uh, low cost. In parallel, of course, we are looking for our own uh, oil and gas. Seven uh, top uh, IOC companies are in, in a uh, production sharing agreement basis are looking for our own oil and gas. Perhaps we, we can continue on that in after intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, some fascinating um, uh, points there. I think many emerging economies will uh, look at uh, your path and wonder uh, how applicable it might be or might not be for them. But I think all countries uh, who don't enjoy the degree of consensus that you've described uh, may be a little envious. So we might come back to how you achieve that uh, when we have our discussion. Um, could I ask uh, Pradeep Sinha, who's the Secretary of Power for the Government of India, to say a little bit about life on the subcontinent, please? Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by saying that if there is one sector which has always been in transition, it is the energy sector. You could be sitting here at any point of time in history and you would still conclude that the energy sector is going through a phase of transition. The latest transition that the world is struggling with is to move away from the fossil fuels to the un unconventional sources. And shale gas has also emerged in that context. Now to give the Indian perspective in brief. Uh, the economy has been growing quite rapidly in the last decade or so, and the energy sector has been struggling to keep pace with the growth of the economy. Today we have 227 gigawatts of installed power generation, out of which 68% is thermal, and out of this thermal about 10% is gas, the rest is coal-based. Nuclear is only 2%. Hydro and renewables taken together is as high as 30%. Now, if you exclude the hydro, 
from the renewables, then the renewables by itself, which would include small hydro, less than 25 megawatt, its contribution to, to the total energy mix is 13%. And within the renewables of 13%, 70% is wind energy, 12% is small hydro, another 12% is bioenergy, and about 6% is solar. But solar is now increasing at a very rapid pace. Just to give an idea of the scale at which we are operating, we add over 20,000 megawatt of power generating capacity every year. Now, I must mention, before I come to the major challenges that we face, one important uh, landmark which contributed in significant measure to enable us to add this kind of capacity in the last decade. If you see just last six years, India has added 75,000 megawatt installed capacity in power generation in only six years. And this has been possible through private sector participation. Bulk of it in the last six years has been added by the private sector, which has saved the government budget from pumping in resources into the power sector. Now, to mention briefly some of the major challenges that we are facing today. One is the fuel shortages. India imports 80% of its crude oil, about 20% of its gas, natural gas requirement, and now it has also started importing coal, despite the fact that we have abundant coal reserves. The reason for that being that the rate at which the demand is increasing, the coal extraction and mining cannot keep pace with that. So in the short term, we are also importing coal. The other challenge that we are facing is in terms of excess. There are still large pockets of rural areas in the country where electricity hasn't reached. One reason is there are very remote areas where the power lines, the transmission and distribution lines haven't reached. We are trying to address this problem through a dedicated scheme of rural electrification. And hopefully in the next few years, we will be able to cover the entire rural population as well. Coming to the next major challenge, affordability. Now this is again a very complex situation which we find ourselves in. Because we have to import gas and we have to import coal now also and also crude oil, we find that the cost of power generation is rising. And if the tariffs are increased, the consumers find themselves unable to buy, particularly in the rural areas and in the states. And if the tariffs are not increased, the generators find it un economically unviable to produce. So this is a major, another major challenge that we are facing, how to address this. Some sort of subsidy is also coming into the system. But this is one area which we must find a solution to. Another major challenge that I should mention is the environmental issues that are coming in hydropower development. Now, fortunately, in the Himalayan region of India, we have a very large hydro potential. But the rate at which we should be able to, to exploit it, we are not able to do so, mainly because of the environmental issues and people-related issues. In the hilly areas, very large land mass has to be submerged in water, villages have to be relocated sometimes, and this, initially there are a lot of protests and also takes time. So it's an irony, really, because hydro is one of the cleaner forms of energy, but to be able to set up hydro projects, you face the most difficult environmental issues. We are trying to address that also. Lastly, I must also mention the successful power grid interconnection between India and Bangladesh, which became operational only 10 days ago. Starting 5th October 2013, when both the Prime Ministers inaugurated, India is supplying 500 megawatt of power to Bangladesh. This, I think, is a really successful regional interconnection, which has also developed a model that can be replicated 
by other regions. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much. And I think uh, everybody would be uh, struck by the scale of the uh, numbers that you've given us and also the, the spread of the challenges across uh, the, the three dimensions of the energy trilemma, really, around energy security, uh, affordability, access, and then uh, the environmental issues, although you've highlighted uh, some aspects of environmental uh, in relation to hydropower, which I don't think uh, have been um, discussed in the earlier sessions where I was present, but we maybe need to think about that uh, in our conversation. Uh, now I turn to uh, Dr. Elham Ibrahim, who's the Commissioner for Infrastructure and Energy of the African Union, and uh, I uh, give you the floor. Thank you very much, and uh, it's really my pleasure to be with you in, uh, in this very important gathering for energy. Um, I think my responsibility is more difficult as I am representing a continent, <laughs> not only one country. And uh, this leads me back to the theme of this session, energy and transition. Uh, from the African perspective, it's transition in the way we are doing business in the energy sector in Africa. This uh, scenario for uh, business as usual is not enough. It cannot be implemented for Africa to be transferred from this current situation which we have I, I'll go through very quickly on that, but I can say that in Africa we have a unique situation. It's a continent which for now has a growing economic growth, which in average more than 6%. It's a, a continent which has a lot of resources of energy even if it is fossil fuel or renewable energy resources. And it, uh, the reserves of Africa represents a high percentage from the worldwide uh, reserves. Again, for, to, co to cope with this increase or uh, economic growth, it was calculated and estimated up to 2040 to have an average increase in the energy demand equivalent to 5.7% annually. This means that we have to increase our generation capacity by 6% or more annually up to 2040. And I can say that the results of the studies done by the WEC is coming in line with the results we, we had in our program for infrastructure development in Africa, which was prepared by the African Union Commission in cooperation with other partners like the African Development Bank and uh, the NIPAD uh, organization for developing the infrastructure up to 2040, including energy, transport, ICT, and transboundary water. For now, we have very clear vision, very a systematic and unified plan for our project up to that date. Uh, again, for Africa, unfortunately, we can say that up till now there are 18 countries where the energy access is less than 10 percent. And in some countries, uh, in the rural areas, the access is less than 1 percent. And we know that many or most of the people live in these rural areas. I can say it is more than 70% live in these areas. That leads us, as Africa, to rearrange our priorities. You said that for um, the energy trilemma, it is three components or three elements. And I think the, the, the priorities which we are given for our continent is first the accessibility and affordability. And if we go to this um, issue of environment, 
we are all know that uh, the Africa participation in the emission is really very, very low. So I think, uh, as it was mentioned, I think in many sessions that uh, these three components can differ from region to region. And for our continent, I think uh, the accessibility and affordability is more uh, important. Uh, to solve uh, this issue as uh, an organization responsible for the whole continent, we set or we added two dimensions for the solution. One of them is the regional projects. Because uh, maybe we all know that the resources may be concentrated in one region while the demand in another region, especially in the energy where we have a very high potential for hydropower, for example. So we are working on regional projects for generation and also for network transmission uh, networks. Uh, the other dimension is uh, energy efficiency, and I think it was uh, mentioned in many uh, of the sessions today and uh, yesterday. Uh, we are supporting very much, and we calculated, or we, we are estimating that about 17% of the needed capacity can be saved by using uh, energy efficiency uh, technologies. I think for the time being, I, I stop here, and we see. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, again, the, there is obviously uh, an issue of scale, but I guess there's also an issue of pace, at that pace of growth, uh, how one uh, struggles to, to keep up and uses the, the electrification as the, the driver for the growth as well as keeping up with it. So you've got a kind of um, feedback loop there, I, I, I guess, that we, uh, we might want to address in a moment. Uh, could I ask uh, Saleh Alawaji, who's the Deputy Minister for Electricity in the government of Saudi Arabia, now to give us his contribution? Thank you, Joan. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor and pleasure to be with you, and uh, let me start by saying some words of appreciation to the host country, Republic of Korea, and also to the organizers, particularly those who uh, enable me to participate in this distinguished event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you uh, a brief about the uh, power sector in Saudi Arabia, and what's applicable in Saudi Arabia is uh, more or less applicable to the GCC region where I am uh, belong, belong to. In uh, our region, especially in Saudi Arabia, we are actually uh, facing almost the same uh, challenges that uh, everywhere uh, in the world uh, are there. And uh, on top of that, or one of them is the high rate of growth. We are experiencing uh, a high rate of growth in demand for the last uh, 30 years, and we're still maintaining the same level of about 8% annually. That actually requests us to add a capacity of uh, like 5,000 uh, megawatt every year. And based on that, our needs for uh, fund for the next 10 years is also another challenge. We, are, we estimate to spend more than 130 billion US dollar for the power project. Uh, hopefully, uh, as a policy of attracting the investors from the, the private sector and enhancing the partnership with the private sector, about one third of this amount should come from the private uh, sector. The other point or the other uh, element of our policy in the power sector is uh, to focus on energy efficiency at both supply and demand. At the supply side, the utility is taking care of that in cooperation with the uh, uh, oil company. And at the demand side, the government is taking the lead of that. And we already have launched uh, intensive and aggressive program in order to achieve what we are expecting from the energy efficiency in order to reduce the demand. 
Another factor is, di is, is the intention to diversify the primary energy sources. In the meantime, we, we are mainly rely, rely on uh, uh, fuel or hydrocarbon, liquid fuel, and natural gas. It's also the government intention and policy to consider all the possible options, options for primary energy sources, including uh, renewable energy and perhaps nuclear. And in this regard, the government now is working on uh, approving a strategy for uh, the, the expansion and uh, of utilizing renewable energy. One of the challenging also facing the uh, country and might be a unique is the large di uh, variation between peak load at summer time and uh, winter time. In the meantime, our installed capacity approaching 60 gigawatt, and our peak load at summer time is approaching this value. While at uh, winter time, our peak load is like 50% of that value, that, that is actually creating a, a, a serious operational uh, challenge for the uh, network. Finally, our policy toward partnership with the private sector is to, to enhance a long-lasting relationship with our partners, especially the major uh, manufacturer and major contractors, as well as uh, uh, institutional uh, investment, uh, ins institutional for investment, and uh, try to maintain uh, sustainable and re reliable as well as efficient relationship. I think I can uh, stop at this point and perhaps we can highlight some of them later on. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and very instructive that um, uh, a, a country which is resource rich in anybody's terms is uh, looking very carefully at the demand side and at the um, uh, other technologies as well as uh, using its uh, natural resources. Could I now ask uh, Maximus Jonity Okili, uh, the Minister of Energy, Green Technology and Water from the Government of Malaysia, uh, to tell us a little bit about uh, the challenges in that country. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Just want to confine my comments to a couple of matters that you have raised. Uh, one, of course, is the issue of uh, sustainability. Um, Countries like ours, um, we have been very conscious about this, um, and it would be a folly to continue to have high dependence on fossil fuels and so forth. So um, <clears throat> we have been focusing on diversifying the energy mix. Uh, today, our installed capacity about 24 gigawatt. We use about 18 to 19 of that uh, 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 daily. Um, we expect 3 to 4 percent growth uh, of uh, energy requirement heading to 2020. Presently, the energy mix is such that uh, 50 percent um, is coming from, uh, uh, coal, coming from gas and another 40 from coal, 9 from hydro and uh, 1 percent uh, coming from uh, uh, renewable. And so looking at that, uh, so looking at sustainability, uh, we see two major things. I mean, number one, of course, is um, to go for renewable, to, to ensure that resources uh, are used vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, their availability and at the maximum level. And, of course, the issue of energy efficiency. And uh, so what are the options? The options available to us, just like I think any other developing countries in, in the same area, one, to use cleaner fuels, you know, uh, <clears throat> such as natural gas where it is economically viable, to use cleaner technologies such as uh, clean coal. Of course, to adopt best practices, and uh, certainly those tested and available in uh, developed countries. Um, promoting and implementing on-site uh, generation through uh, uh, coal generation. Um, and of course, uh, in terms of load management by utility through smart grid uh, implementation. 
these are options that uh, we are taking up at various levels. Uh, and I think uh, this can be more or less the kind of options being also uh, faced uh, by other countries in, in the same category. The other points I want to comment is uh, your comment earlier, your statement earlier about uh, developing countries and the lack maybe of political and institutional stability for long term uh, energy investment. I think it is the story is not as uh, dire and it's not as negative as what may be perceived. I think many economists like ours, we are increasingly being scrutinized uh, by the international rating agencies, our debt versus our GDP, issues of transparencies, issues of uh, corruption, and so forth. And so in dealing with energy or power, or as well as other sectors, you know, we've been going for competitive bidding, for instance, for our large uh, uh, installations. Yes, we have a single buyer uh, in the country, single utility, but we have enforced single buyer regulations. We have been uh, implementing ring fencing. We are even moving into incentive-based kind of regulations uh, to make sure that uh, utilities produce them, produce the energy at the most efficient uh, level uh, subject to uh, 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 open uh, principles of governance and so forth. So um, these are necessary because uh, investment in the energy sector, they take a, a long time for recovery. Uh, and therefore the signal to the private sector is very crucial. So our experience uh, in this matter is that um, ensuring a strong political institution and stability is not an option. Uh, I think it is essentially uh, has to be part and parcel of, the, uh, of governance uh, with respect to government and the utilities. And it's not an option at all to me. With uh, with the electorate becoming uh, environmentally uh, sensitive and educated, uh, with they becoming uh, 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 you know uh, Facebook fast. Facebook uh, fads and so forth, uh, we are at the mercy of uh, international uh, commentary and uh, uh, observation. And uh, based on that, ensuring political stability, in ensuring uh, stability of institution uh, is a must. It's a matter of survival politically rather than an option. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and I think um, uh, you're picking up some important themes there around uh, the political or governance frameworks that might be needed for driving investment, but how that will be perceived uh, by the investors as well. Um, now we uh, are going to hear from Amilcar Acosta, the Minister of Energy and Mining, uh, for the government of Colombia. Eh, Colombia dispone de una muy amplia base eh, y muy diversa en fuentes primarias de energía. Dispone de eh, abundante carbón, reservas importantes de crudo, de gas natural y un gran potencial en materia hidroeléctrica. Uh, Colombia has an ample basis of resources, uh, a lot of uh, uh, hydro ones, uh, coal fields, and also oil and gas. En los últimos años es, eh, se ha comprometido el país en un gran esfuerzo por ampliar sus reservas, especialmente en petróleo y gas, y para ello eh, ha hecho una gran apuesta por los hidrocarburos no convencionales, tanto en Shell Gas como en Shell Oil, además del gas metano asociado al carbón. Uh, Colombia, in the, during the last years, have tried to, has tried to uh, expand oil and gas uh, resources and uh, also in, in, in the matter of uh, unconventional oil and gas 
uh, including shale gas, shale oil, and coal uh, and methane-based coal. Eh, Colombia dispone de un sistema eléctrico suficientemente robusto eh, que cuenta con una gran firmeza y confiabilidad y ello ha sido posible gracias no solo al gran esfuerzo que ha hecho los distintos gobiernos, sino la gran contribución que ha hecho la inversión privada. Uh, the electric power system uh, is strong and uh, has expanded uh, on all over the country and uh, it, it, it has been so because of the effort of the government but also from, via the private companies. Más del 70% de la base de generación es de origen hídrico y la generación térmica es fundamentalmente con base en gas natural y adicionalmente disponemos de un parque de generación eólica que aunque es incipiente es el comienzo de un gran esfuerzo en el que se está comprometiendo el país en energías renovables. Uh, store capacity is mainly based on uh, hydro resources. Uh, we have thermal plants mainly fueled by gas. And now we have a, a small development in, uh, wind, in a wind uh, plant in the northern part of the country. Y a propósito del, del trilema que ha sido el eje de las discusiones en este importante congreso, eh, se viene también adelantando por parte del gobierno un esfuerzo para mejorar la calidad de los combustibles. Hasta hace muy pocos años, en Colombia se venía consumiendo eh, eh, gasolina y diésel de muy baja calidad diésel hasta con 500 partes por millón de contenido de azufre y en estos momentos se, el que se consume en el país está por debajo de las 50 partes por millón que es el estándar internacional. Uh, regarding the energy trilemma, uh, one point is that Colombia uh, is looking for uh, cleanest uh, fuels and uh, uh, now we have a, a fuel of uh, uh, 50 parts of sulfur, which is uh, one tenth of the situation before. Adicionalmente a ello, se ha avanzado muchísimo en la conversión eh, a gas de los vehículos automotores y estamos emprendiendo ahora un nuevo impulso a ampliar esa conversión a gas natural y utilizando también gas licuado de petróleo. Uh, vehicles now can use uh, gas and we also intend to, to, to move towards the usage of GLP in, 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 in the motor park. Todos estos avances han sido posibles gracias a una gran fortaleza institucional. Nosotros le hemos dicho no al intervencionismo estatal, pero también le hemos dicho no a la desregulación. Tenemos reglas claras del juego y estables que han sido el gran atractivo para la inversión y los inversionistas en Colombia para este sector. Uh, results and benefits have been reached thanks to the uh, institutional framework, the efforts coming from the government and also from the participation of the private uh, uh, utilities. Uh, and uh, uh, we have, had in a process, have been in a process of deregulation for the last 20 years. Para Colombia, la palabra clave es confianza. Y gracias a ello, eh, 
se puede mostrar el índice de sostenibilidad energética en el cual Colombia ocupa el lugar 21 entre 129 países, destacándose el cuarto lugar en sostenibilidad ambiental y el quinto lugar en seguridad energética, quedándonos como una asignatura pendiente lo que hace relación a la equidad. Uh, the key aspect is sustainability, and we are very well ranked in, among one, more 129 countries. We are fourth in sustainability in terms of environment aspects and social aspects. We are placed in the fifth place. Gracias. Thank you very much, and thanks for the translation, uh, which will be called upon again, I'm sure. Um, I guess uh, uh, from that, we're hearing really about uh, uh, an evolution uh, under the framework that you had uh, with the move to deregulation and the involvement in the private sector, which has brought benefits. But from all of the contributions, um, I think there is a, a, a question, really, which is particularly for the developing and emerging economies, which is how to meet the growing energy demand. I mean, we've heard about the strong push for growth in many of the countries and regions. How to meet that demand without locking in future climate or other environmental threats. So I wonder if one of you would like to comment uh, on, on that uh, question. Elham, would you please? Uh, thank you very much. I, I think in, in this area, we need to deal with the problem or with the issue globally. Not only even regionally, but globally, because there is the R&D there is a technology, and there is the resources. So why not to work together to develop the available resources on a win-win basis for everybody? It will be a success for everyone to, to, to have the energy, to, keep the, um, to, to, to give access to the people who are not uh, uh, able to, to get uh, the energy access, and at the same time to, to do business for those uh, for developed uh, countries, for example, they have the technology, they have uh, uh, the, the resources or let us say the, the investment capacity. So let us do it together. It is for the benefit for everyone because at the end it is the globe or the, the, the world is, is one. And if we keep this big difference between uh, some people suffering and other people um, enjoying different uh, benefits, I think it will, uh, the, the balance will not be there and problems can, can rise. So I think in my point of view, we have to deal with these issues globally, using the technology, the R&D, and the resources, and the people who are there. Thank you. Uh, Pradeep, please. Uh, in this context, I think I would like to emphasize that, you know, in the emerging economies and developing countries, access is a major issue, uh, energy access and affordability. Now, in this context, when we are trying to, you are trying to move away from environmentally polluting sources of fuel, uh, naturally hydro and renewables, renewables come into mind. But one way of uh, doing that, I think, I think the distributed generation, the so-called distributed generation, I think uh, can contribute significantly, which can combine the rural access objective also, because uh, you know many of the emerging and developing economies, they have uh, good renewable resources in terms of solar potential and wind potential. And uh, if the successful models, business models can be developed, for involving not only government agencies, but also the private sector in the distribution, distributed generation, then I think we are combining several objectives in one. You know, we are trying to provide access also, 
and we are trying to move away from uh, to environmentally sustainable generation and also to enhance enhancing your capacity thank you uh, ramon yes i think that you can go either to uh, energy integration uh, um, distributed generation but there are two keys that are absolutely essential if you, if, if you want to, to do the change. First is the regulatory framework and the investment framework. Without a clear uh, position of the state, the finance policies, long-term policies, stable and transparent uh, regulatory framework is very difficult to attract investment. And uh, the second point is uh, the the sense of the subsidies. I think this point is absolutely crucial for the next years. We need sust uh, economically sustainable policies. With subsidies, it's very difficult to achieve this sustainability. No subsidies, neither for renewables nor for fossil fuels. These, together with clear long-term policies, is the way to attract investors. According to, to the precise uh, um, context of a given country, this can be achieved with more or less uh, renewals, with more or less uh, natural gas or, or uh, uh, different, different uh, nuclear particularly, but for, if, independently of the portfolio you use, you need stable regulatory framework with a clear presence of, of the state in order to, to uh, allow the, the participants of uh, private investors. Is that point uh, striking a chord with uh, everybody on the panel or is there a different view on uh, whether subsidies are needed to drive uh, the, um, the investment, Sally? Yeah, I, think, and, uh, I, you know, I think I will respond to that because, you see, as I mentioned in my opening remarks also that many of the emerging and developing economies in many of the developing economies, definitely India, you know, we are going through fuel shortages and we are having to import fuel. So when uh, you are having to import fuel, the cost of generation goes up and affordability becomes an issue. So in such a situation, government intervention becomes necessary. Now, whatever you call it, you call it subsidy, you, you, but in some sort of government intervention becomes necessary so that that costly power can reach the people. And, but certainly it cannot be, a, cannot be for all times. It has to be a short-term measure and ultimately you have to move towards your own energy security so that uh, you know, the subsidy regime or whatever government intervention, I would like to use that word, whatever, government, whatever way government decides to intervene has to ultimately go. Sally. Uh, thank you. I think uh, to answer this question, uh, Joanne, or to find the solution for uh, this question to provide energy for everybody at affordable uh, price without uh, harming the uh, environment is uh, maybe something uh, I would say impossible. Um, maybe like uh, getting a kind of mechanism to avoid, uh, I wouldn't say actually subsidy, but a contribution of the uh, uh, policy makers or the governments in, 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 in helping consumers might be applicable for the small, uh, I mean, for the area where there is a, a light loads, like for instance, rural area or where the uh, weather conditions are uh, uh, in a situation not pushing people to consume a huge amount of uh, electrical energy. But in a region like our region, where we have to use electricity for air conditioning, and more than 70% of our uh, residential consumption going for air conditioning, I think people will not be able to afford the price. I mean, if, they, if the price reflect, reflecting the real cost. So I think there should be a way or another to uh, help people in order to get what, what, what they need at a uh, reasonable price. I think working on efficiency, investing in, on efficiency, and also in educating people uh, could help a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's extremely important. I'm conscious that we are talking as well about two different 
categories of subsidy, if you will. I mean, the subsidies for uh, uh, lower carbon technologies and then subsidies for uh, people who are too poor uh, to uh, afford um, energy services. But, um, Walter, would you like to come in on this discussion? Yes, please. I think uh, we have to discuss if it's better to invest and to give subsidies for investment, for example, to reduce energy consumption in buildings. Why should we have subsidies for uh, using oil or other to have uh, cold uh, uh, air in the houses? I think, first of all, we have to prevent and build and construct houses that have zero energy consumption. And then afterwards, we have not a big discussion, big discussion how much subsidies we use every year for that. Second, I believe in markets, and markets have prices. And if we have higher prices, I think then the consumption will go down. And I think in the whole world, we have a lot of subsidies for fossil fuels, and in the long run, we should go out of that and look that the market have the effects that we think they should have. Uh, thank you. Uh, Saleh and then Minister Acosta. Yes, actually, just I have a comment on what uh, the minister has mentioned. That is ideal, but also there is associated cost. I mean, in order to build a very efficient building, I think there is a tremendous cost associated with that. And also to have very efficient air conditioning unit, there is an extra cost associated with that. So who will take care of that? I mean, do we uh, shift that to the consumers or somebody else need, need to, take care of it, to take care of it? I think this is a valid question. Thank you. Let us hear from Minister Acosta and then we can come back. Aquí tiene necesariamente que contarse con el apoyo gubernamental. Eh, habrá segmentos muy importantes de la población que no podrán nunca acceder a la prestación del servicio de energía si no es subsidiado por el Estado. Pero las tecnologías de energías renovables tampoco es posible que se desarrollen si no hay apoyo y subvención por parte del Estado. Allí es en donde el Estado debe intervenir para que el mercado funcione apropiadamente. First of all, I was uh, necessary. Uh, there are consumers that... Can we have the microphone for the translation, please? Uh, the support of the government is necessary because there are vast sectors of consumers uh, that can afford for the energy price and uh, the situation is the same if you use renewables for the solutions because those are more expensive and so some help would be needed. Okay, Switzerland is a member of the Friends of Fossil Fuels. We think we should in the long run re make a reduction of subsidies in fossils. Second, I think it's better to give once a subsidy for investment in a building than give every year subsidies to, for the consumption of energy. Third, instead of giving subsidies for investments, you can also use, use laws and make standards and labels and say, listen, in our country, we accept now only new houses, new buildings with zero emission or with zero energy consumption. That's possible. That's a way. We try to go this way and I think it's uh, the better for the wealth of our nations. 
Thank you. Ramon? Yes, let me emphasize what you say, Joanne. Uh, there are two kinds of subsidies. One is the social subsidy for those people that, do, that need a government help in order to reach to energy access. And the other is subsidies, cross subsidies between different, uh, between different uh, energy sources. And we all know that there are five billion dollars per year subsidies for fossil fuels and only, uh, only 60 billion subsidies for renewals. If there were no subsidies at all, there would be more, it would be more easy just with market to, to, for, for uh, renewals energy to be, to be present in many places. And, and my second point is, there are examples where if you choose appropriate sources and appropriate technologies, renewable energies can now go just grid parity without any kind of subsidies. In our country, the cost of wind energy is only six dollar cents per kilowatt hour. The cost of, of, of photovoltaic, of course, is, is, is more than that. But if you, if you use appropriate uh, technology for your uh, natural resources, now we can reach uh, appropriate cost as, for example, I repeat once again, in Uruguay, more than 90% of uh, electric, uh, uh, of renewals in the, in the electric mix, and the average generation cost is only $5.00. This is possible without subsidies today. Thank you very much. Uh, Maximus Jonati yeah, um, um, I mean, this is part of the dilemma, the trilemma. You know. uh, one hand, we want to... Uh, go for security and sustainability, and yet we also want to handle issue on uh, 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 equity and so forth. So it, it is not easy to manage. Um, I think most developing countries uh, are conscious that subsidies uh, cause distortion, and, and uh, an effort should be done to slowly reduce subsidies, making sure that subsidies get to the right people that deserve them. And in the energy side, uh, what we do in our part of the world is we have a pass-through mechanism. There's an increase in the price of gas. We don't increase the subsidy. We pass it through. We take care of those people who are affected uh, through, uh, say, a stabilization uh, policy. Um, at the industry level, um, yeah, there's an element of subsidy, uh, I think, in most of the countries. Because it's also an issue of competition. I mean, rates are cheaper in other countries. Investors shift, you see? So until we can sort out all these things, you know, an argument, and any argument purely on uh, economic efficiency is not sufficient to, 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 to determine the, the progress of nations. So I think we need to be sensible, but I think practical and with all the... I think uh, bilateral arrangement and uh, like in ASEAN uh, free trade zone coming in and all this, we are addressing these issues. But I think it's uh, not possible to ignore that second part of the triangle uh, without some cost. But the thing should be, it's a cost that can be justified. It's a cost that go to the right people. Then I think it's justified on the ground. Pradeep and then... You know, in, 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 in this energy trilemma, any effort to paint every country with the same brush is very dangerous. We must, first of all, recognize that. Now, in that triangle, in the energy tri trilemma, which you have just, you know, depicted through a triangle, beautifully depicted, now, if you actually try and locate each country, you will find that each country is located at a different point within the triangle. And therefore, each country has to chart out its own path while moving to the center of the triangle, which is the best location which has to be moved to because it is equidistant from all the three objectives. So, uh, you, I mean, I don't, it's very dangerous if we try to give any argument from the developed world side or any from the developing world side and try to paint the whole world with the same brush. Since each country is placed at a different location, it will necessarily follow a different path. It is nobody, nobody's case that market should be distorted. Everybody recognizes that ultimately the market forces should determine the prices. But while moving towards those market forces, 
each country will chart out its own path because it, it has to, for them the equity aspect is right now more important than the other aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think that is a, a very useful uh, point because uh, I think we do actually say in the Trilemma Report, we use your actual words, uh, each country must chart its own path. Having said which, uh, there is, uh, I think, some potential for countries to learn from similar countries uh, where maybe there are uh, challenges which have been met successfully or so forth. Uh, but on that note, um, perhaps this would be a good time to take two or three questions from the audience. We'll take all of the questions and then ask the panel to respond. So, do I see anybody uh, burning to ask a question of the distinguished members of the panel? Could you stand up? Because it's not easy to see otherwise. If you... Uh, the gentleman in the... Uh, oh, Norbert, yes, please. Uh, Norberto Medeiro, John. Brazil. Uh, I liked so much the initial ideas of the Trilemma study, and I liked so much the takeaways. But I'm not in love with the index ranking. Imagine it if China and India, with more than 3 billion people, to arrive to a per capita income of 25.5 as uh, the first 10 trip away. I don't know if it, the, the world has resources for it. I put this question to the... Uh, who on the panel would like to respond to uh, Norbert's point? I, I'm not sure, Norbert, that, that I really understood a question. I mean, I understood you saying that there could be uh, an implication, but maybe could you point the question for the panel? Could we have the, the microphone back to uh, ensure we're tackling your point? Look, the first 10... Uh, uh, Triple A, they have higher income uh, GDP more than 25.5 uh, dollars per capita. Uh, they have a post-industrial service based economies, OECD members, and high use of low and zero carbon energy sources. Okay, but. A large country, let's uh, have the example of India and China. They have three billion people. How to, <laughs> to achieve a trip away? Do we have resources in the world for it? So I think the question is, uh, can India and China uh, achieve the same kind of um, uh, performance given how different they are from those countries at the top ranking? I mean, given uh, that uh, the, the top countries are um, post-industrial, you might say, uh, using Norberto's words. W Walter, do you want to comment? Yes, I think it's not possible to make a ranking with the global view and have no differences. There is one is wealth, one is uh, the country, how much people they have, and so on. But for me, it's clear. I want to learn from other countries. I want to see what they do, in which fields they are better than Switzerland. And the second one, we have also to think about what do we have to do national. 
and in which fields we better cooperate. And for example, also, that's clean tech. We export our engineers to other countries and they can tell other countries how, for example, we take used water to produce it and to have less fossil fuel consumption. This is a possibility that gives us a ranking like is made now, made now from uh, this uh, forum here. Thank you. Pradeep? Uh, well, if you recollect, this question was raised in the morning session also in the ministerial roundtable. And I think uh, both that gentleman who raised and my friend from Brazil, I think they have a good point. You know, this effort to rank the countries, you didn't mention, you mentioned that there are six countries, which only, only six countries which have achieved a triple, uh, achieved an A score. Triple A, sorry, that is for credit rating. <laughs> so, so I have, you didn't mention the names, but I can straight away guess that these will be those countries which are number one, having good energy resources and also are sufficiently developed. You can easily guess because the indicators are like that. I think this whole effort of trying to rank in terms of the en energy trilemma is again akin to trying to paint the whole world with the same brush. To me, what is more important is to see where, is to make every country see where exactly in the trilemma they are located and whether they have charted out their, their path and how fast they move towards the central point. I think that's more important. Thank you. Does anybody else from the panel want to contribute on this point? Ramon? Yes, perhaps. Thank you, John. In fact, uh, if, if AAA is something that you want everybody to imitate because it's, it's a good example, then we should be in problem. Because I can guess that among all those, this AAA, there has been some of them that, 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 that the average energy uh, consumption should be perhaps 10 times that of the average citizen in China, for example, or in India. So it's, so I, I, it's, it's evident that if all the world tried to go exactly, to follow exactly the same path, there will be, we'll need a, a couple of, of, of planets, or perhaps three planets in order to, to feed all this energy. Thank you. Is there another question, uh, gentlemen, uh, uh, Antonio Clerici? Oh, good evening to everyone. <laughs> Just uh, to one general question. Just I am the chairman also of the World Energy Resources of uh, WEC. I am from Cesi, Italy. Just if we look now, 82% of primary energy is coming from fossil fuel. Around 10% from biomasses, 1.2% of all other renewables. Do you believe that in the short time is the panacea the other renewable? Second question to my friend Alawaji. You are mentioning your big program for energy efficiency. Now, I know from uh, my friends, from you, my friends here, that you are paying gasoline less than one-tenth of what I pay in Italy. You are, pay, you are paying electricity 20 times less of what I am paying in my home. In which way can you implement pushing on the consumer size and energy efficiency if the return on the investment that I do it would be infinite time because with so low uh, rates, so which uh, approach are you think is would be compulsory to do what I am very curious of, of that uh, my friend Saleh would you like to respond yes I come to the last point maybe we will invite you to join us in our society and enjoy the same prices uh, actually despite despite the fact that the prices are very low there is now a serious movement toward energy efficiency and I assure that the government of Saudi Arabia and also in the region, they are very keen to 
uh, improve the uh, efficiency of the use of energy, and perhaps there might be some kind of uh, review of, uh, of, of tariffs or prices. Uh, I think we, we, I agree with you. With this level of price, uh, I think we will not be able to achieve, at least uh, encourage people to invest by their own in energy efficiency activities since the payback period will be very long. Regarding to the penetration of renewable energy, uh, if I may say something about it, uh, yes, the uh, world uh, percentage or the uh, contribution at the worldwide percentage is uh, very low, but I think with the uh, new development uh, and also with the uh, huge fund on R&D and also uh, based on the efforts that we supposed to put in this direction, I would assume that renewable energy can contribute more. I think one of the uh, perhaps tools that could help in enhancing the use uh, of uh, renewable energy is uh, also reinforcing the uh, interconnection among the regions. Uh, as you all know, the significant challenge in uh, uh, using renewable energy nowadays is the energy storage. And I think with, the, uh, with, with having uh, very effective and uh, uh, network covering uh, large range of uh, distances uh, and also uh, possibility of trading and exchanging energy that will enhance the penetration or the enhance the uh, use of renewable energy and uh, you know there is a lot of hope in that thank you thank you very much would anybody else on the panel like to comment either on the energy efficiency or the move to renewables point Ellen. Uh, thank you. I, I think for renewable energy specifically, in some cases, it is the only solution. So I, I think whatever the percentage in, the, in general, but in some cases, it is the only economic solution for, for some regions. So let us encourage uh, renewable energy and not uh, to fight. Uh, I, I'm not saying to fight against, but it has a role. It differs from uh, one place to another place, in, some, in one case to another case. But as I mentioned, in some cases, it is the only economic solution. And I think the people there, they have the right to, to get access to electricity. Minister uh, Costa <clears throat> and then Minister Onikili. Hoy, como ya se acaba de decir, el 80% de la energía que se consume en el mundo es de origen fósil y de acuerdo a las, a, lo, a las proyecciones de la Agencia Internacional de Energía, todavía para el año eh, 2040 estaríamos hablando de un 60% todavía de energía de origen fósil. Lo, y, y esto antes de dos hechos que en mi concepto eh, van a influir en que ese porcentaje vaya a ser mayor. Por una parte, el accidente de Fukushima eh, frenó el avance de la energía nuclear. Y segundo, la revolución de los esquistos con los hidrocarburos no convencionales harán que la participación de los de la energía de origen fósil sea mayor para el año 2040. Uh, at present, 80% of the energy in the world has origin in fossil fuels. In 25 years time, it will be 60%, but perhaps more. If you take into account two facts, the accident of Fukushima and uh, the findings in unconventional fuels. En esas condiciones y sabiendo que el avance de las energías alternativas, de las energías renovables, es lento, es indispensable 
eh, acometer programas de transición que busquen mejorar la calidad de la energía de origen fósil. En ese sentido, los biocombustibles, por ejemplo, son parte de la solución, porque lo que hace los biocombustibles es reducir las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero de los combustibles de origen fósil. Uh, given that uh, the evolution of renewables is uh, slow, uh, for the transition we should look for uh, other solutions like uh, biofuels uh, that produce uh, lesser amounts of uh, 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 gases. Mm -hmm. Thank Madam, you. just want to comment on uh, energy efficiency. Uh, much discussion in the earlier uh, sessions. Uh, <clears throat> we define it as uh, low-lying foods, and what the statistics say, you can go up 10 to 15 percent of natural use if you go into energy efficiency. It could be saved in terms of total energy consumption. The problem with low-lying foods, uh, you know. Uh, they think the fruits up the tree is uh, sweeter than the one that's down the, on the lower branches. You see? So not many people harvest uh, uh, this, uh, this stuff. You know? um, there are a few problems. Maybe in developed countries, we are looking at models of successful operation of uh, 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 energy efficiency. But in uh, developing economies, um, number one, you have to argue whether you want to go for legislating or regulations or incentives. You know? And you're talking about incentives, um, say, within a government machinery. You know? you, we ask departments and agencies to reduce, uh, in a, improve energy efficiency, change to LED, put sensors, and other mechanisms. Huh? But when they save, say, 15% the next year, the Treasury reduce the, reduce the budget for, uh, for, 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 for power. You see? So no incentive for the agencies to do, to do extra uh, and so forth. So there has to be some transformation in many treasuries, uh, including our, our part, uh, in order to reward uh, savings and, uh, and so forth. Then I think it can go on fire. Of course, it's also a matter of lifestyle. And this is where maybe in the developed world, we need to look at countries that um, it has become a habit for people to, to conserve. We just waste too much. Uh, uh, energy in our uh, in, in the developing economies because uh, you know leave lights on and so forth and uh, these are enormous costs in terms of sustainability so we are looking at some maybe successful models of this thank you uh, thank you um, Ramon very short uh, comments concerning your, your your question first one size and not fit all the fact that in average 85%, 82% of, of the primary energy mix is uh, fossil does not mean that there, there could be some countries or some regions where the, 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 the thing is, is absolutely different than the average. Second, there already are some countries and some regions where, which are absolutely different than the average and we already have an important amount of renewals at, at very competitive cost. Third, the fact of having uh, perhaps now more than 100 or even 200 years of reserve of, of uh, fossil fuel does, does not mean that the world uh, accept this amount of, of uh, greenhouse emission for the following 100 years. And so the question will be, should we only use what nature brings us or should we try to dramatically change what, we, what, what, what uh, business as usual uh, gives us if we want to avoid four or five degrees uh, increase in, in temperature. And fourth and last, uh, um, uh, we already know some figures which are interesting. Since three years from now, more than one half of new installed capacity is renewables all over the world. These are numbers that are already present. 
Thank you very much. Uh, because we started late, we're going to run a little bit longer than that clock implies, but not much because one of our colleagues has to catch a plane. But what I'd like to do is give each of you, starting from that end of the room, uh, the opportunity to make one point that you would uh, like to highlight from the conversation above all. It's not compulsory if you don't have one. And then I will try to draw out uh, three to five key points from uh, the discussion we've been having. Minister Acosta. Yo aprovecho este momento para hacerles la invitación a que nos acompañen el año entrante en la asamblea que tendrá lugar en Cartagena, Colombia, en donde serán muy bien recibidos para darle continuidad a este esfuerzo de la comunidad internacional para enfrentar este trilema. Okay, Mr. Minister takes advantage of the opportunity in order to invite all of you uh, next year to Cartagena, Colombia for the next uh, WEC assembly. So you will be very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Onkili? Uh, yeah, Madam Chairman. Perhaps just one more comment on this issue on subsidies, especially subsidies on inputs uh, for power, whether it's for gas, or distillates, and so forth. Uh, um, I said earlier, I think governments and the developing economies are deeply conscious. And um, many are pegging, beginning to peg the price of inputs uh, of resource to market price. Uh, the, the challenge is uh, balancing those affected groups, whether they're going to be industry, uh, we're going to be uh, individuals. Um, I think dealing with uh, equity side, uh, whether it's access or affordability, at least government can implement stabilization programs. But definitely there is a compelling reason, I think, to go towards market price and then perhaps use that amount of subsidy to even buy power at the premium price uh, from renewables, uh, uh, whether it be biomass, uh, whether uh, there be, uh, you know, uh, solar. Uh, solar in our part of the world is oversubscribed. Uh, we have a lot of space for biomass and uh, biogas uh, coming from the agriculture sector, <coughs> which at the moment uh, 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 a few couple of hundred megs are still available. But uh, as they say, biochemistry is harder than just putting on panels of solar, you know. But we are inviting people who want to exploit this sector. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can say that uh, our power sector is uh, obliged to meet, uh, to meet the requirements of the consumers. Uh, home requirements are very essential to consider, especially to get uh, sufficient uh, supply of energy at affordable uh, price. And with all challenges, uh, challenges that we are facing in, in power sector, uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities for the private sector. As I mentioned before, that we are expecting to have one third of uh, the fund required from the power sector, I mean from the private sector. So uh, I would invite uh, every one of you uh, as investors to consider the potential of uh, uh, the market there and uh, perhaps uh, one day, one of you will be a partner in the market. Uh, I want to conclude with uh, saying uh, a word regarding to energy efficiency. I think energy efficiency uh, could contribute a lot in, in meeting the uh, demand in future, but uh, uh, with that, there will be associated a cost and a huge investment uh, that need to be uh, uh, taken care by some one or another. So who will take care of that? I think this is still a valid question. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen? Uh, thank you. I have a very quick two points. One of them is general, uh, that if we want to deliver on the sustainable <coughs> energy for all, we have to keep the energy on the post-2015 development agenda, not to repeat what we did 
in the past. The second point is that uh, uh, to say that Africa is open and invites all interested partners to accompany her in its development journey on win-win basis. So welcome to Africa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, one aspect which probably we haven't talked uh, enough about and which has always been the cause of energy transition and also in a sense encompasses all the three dimensions of the energy tri trilemma is the technological innovations and the R&D changes which keep happening all the time. Uh, today, if uh, you know whatever we are discussing, if tomorrow there were to be an important technological invention, much of what we are discussing may be just irrelevant. So I think, and that is one element which, which influences all the three dimensions of uh, the energy trilemma. Through technological improvements, we can improve access, we can improve affordability, we can improve uh, sustainability, and we can also improve energy security. Thank you. I think that we are in an extremely interesting moment in history, energy history. And let me put the trilemma in, in the other way around. We are very happy for having discovery larger and larger reservoirs of, of, of uh, traditional fossil fuels at the same moment when the International Panel of Climate Change is telling, you, is telling us that if you continue to use fossil fuels as we are, we should be in very deep problem in a few amounts of decades. And the second way of looking at the dilemma is that once again, we are, we are seeing that we have no solution how to reach those 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 billion inhabitants of this planet that still are living from the energetic point of view as we used to live in the Middle Ages. So these are two points that we are, are I think that we really should have to, to think together on how to face them. And I think the answer is policies, policies, and policies. Uh, we need to, be, uh, to, to have clear ideas on how to continue to give clear answers to, to the investors and to the private companies on which sector it is interested to, to, to invest. And this can be only be done with clear, public, stable, transparent policies. For us, it's clear. The trilemma targets are relevant. We all reach them in the future. We have different ways, but we have also to look that we work together. We all know renewables, they will be cheaper and cheaper in the future, but we have to solve the problem. The first one, storage. The second one, we need grids, and we need balanced smart grids on a lower level. We think it's possible to make a new business case with renewables. And on the other side, we know that we have to have a lot of research in energy fields. Let's work together in that because then it's easier to get the targets. And the last point, don't only look to the future, look also that we are ready to manage possible crises. A brownout, a blackout in one of our counties will have effects of global value and we have to look that we are prepared to manage all crises and to look that there will be no crisis. Thanks. Thank you very much and thank you for all those additional points to add to the very rich conversation we've been having for the past hour or so. The title of the uh, session was Energy in Transition. And I think when we went into that discussion around subsidies, that illustrated the point very clearly. Because whichever sense you are talking about subsidies, they are needed for transitional purposes, either to get your new technologies uh, to grid parity ready for the market, able to deploy at scale, or to help uh, with 
people who cannot afford uh, particular uh, energy services at the moment until the prosperity can be spread to them so that they can. So that subsidy discussion, which uh, I cannot possibly do justice to, it was so uh, full, uh, I think was an important illustration of the fact that we are dealing with a system in transition. That's my first point. The second point is the um, whole issue around uh, energy efficiency and whether there is a return on investment and how you deliver it. And clearly a lot of support for um, resource efficiency and sustainable use of resources. But we, we are challenged by how we make it happen, how we ensure there's the return on investment what role the standards play, and so on. But there is clearly huge unrealized potential there, and I think the policy makers who are not party to this discussion uh, need to uh, see this very clearly on their radar, as you all have this afternoon. And for all of us, we need to think about how we can be as smart as possible in executing the actions to deliver the promise that that holds. Um, the third point that came over extremely clearly, and it's an obvious point, but you exposed it in a, 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 such a, 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 a brilliant way, both personally and personal experiences and at the general level, is that one size does not fit all. Each country must make its own path taking into account its own circumstances, what strengths it has, how it takes advantage of what it has, whether it has resource endowment or a low resource endowment, but helped, I hope, as several people said on the panel, uh, by more collaboration, because these are global problems, and Ellen's uh, repeated point about win-win solutions through helping the developing countries uh, chart their path to sustainable development, uh, I think is one we all agree with and we hope can be acted on uh, at the, the global level. My final point is that actually the Trilemma work recognizes that and aims to be a support to help learning among uh, peer countries or where there's a particular example of best practice. But we had the challenge on ranking and we've had that at other occasions during the day and also the significance of AAA, which it's true. At the moment, the few countries that have received AAA tend to be the richer ones. But it is also true that some of the uh, poorer countries way outperform their peers because of what Ramon has called policies, policies, policies. And that's a strong message that the quality of policy matters, whatever your circumstances are. And I hope that however we go forward with the index and with the trilemma work, and it will benefit from the discussions this afternoon very greatly, I hope that that will help in making good policy and of course, that is a burden that rests on all of your shoulders. So uh, any help that can be given uh, should be given. And we would like to uh, seek to do that. And that brings me back finally to uh, the fact that uh, the index and the trilemma are to support the policy makers in trying to grapple with these challenges at a time of uh, really unprecedented a pace of transition in the energy sector and we've heard today from so many people how energy is at the heart of prosperity of well-being and so uh, what could be more important uh, than our conversations on this topic I'm sure the audience would like to join me in thanking very warmly, uh, the frank and, uh, as I've said, very rich and uh, uh, interesting insights from all of our panel, and thank you for your questions.